Mr. Toy Adebola, you welcome to my success story. Mr. Toy Adebola, you. you are a successful businessman, um, a waste management um, recycling professional, um, a musical artist, and of course a biker. Um, but before I probe on the professional, I'd like to touch on the personal. Um, you were born in the Asian city of Kano. Tell us about that. Um, yeah, well, my, both my parents are civil servants. My mom was a nurse, or is it? Yeah, well, she's a nurse, was a nurse, or is, I don't know, she's retired now. Oh, so uh, my dad was a teacher. Yeah. And uh, somehow, in the course of trying to make, you know, to uh, create life for themselves, yeah. you know, whatever, you know, how it, how it, you know how it works, they found themselves in Kano. I mean, my father was not somebody who was strange to the north, because his own father, I think, um, also walked some part of the north, I think somewhere in Maiduguri or something like that. Okay. So my father wasn't strange to the north, but eventually he, you know, he grew up in Ibadan and found himself in some part of the north and then eventually ended up in Kano. And, you know, married my mom and the whole crew were born there, 10 of us. So. 10 of you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so. Yeah. What number are you, 10? Number one. Number one? Oh, beautiful. So, um, I mean, Kanu now, uh, you hear a lot of, um, did it have an influence on you um, growing up? Was there any particular thing about Kanu that shaped your idea of the world? Or? Yeah, I think the Northern man's ideology shaped me, really. Okay. You know, they, uh, they're very peaceable people. They are loyal people. They, are, they don't take life too difficult, you yeah. know. They, it's not like life for them is not a do or die yeah. kind of thing. And yeah. it's my philosophy to life give life the best you've got but don't you know don't stress everything and don't don't like crack your head against the wall when things are not going your way necessarily okay. it taught me you know growing up in the north in the north taught me loyalty taught taught me patience and taught me to take things easy you know even though i'm very aggressive and you know uh, driven when it comes to goals and objectives yeah. and things that i have to do but at the same time i'm easy going you know i i try to be level-headed most of the time which is which are all things that you know i learned from from growing up in the north yes. so you speak house fluently oh really yeah i hear you're called tembingewa that's that's what they call in kanu uh, in kanu state. Uh, yeah i hear that uh, you hear it now and then but it wasn't something that i used or no, was no, used no, you know used to you maybe know maybe do the interview in house maybe <laughs> and then you have to use subtitles <laughs> then <laughs> okay so yeah. let's talk a bit about the professional um how, how did you get into waste um management and recycling? Well, that's a passion for me that hasn't really kicked off. Okay. You know, it's something that I've spent probably maybe six, seven years researching, okay. you know, uh, and I think it still has a long way to go. It's something that I'm very passionate about, yeah. but I'm into other things, you know, because if you're smart, I mean, you, would, you don't want to spend all your time chasing something, especially when it's a long-term goal. Okay. Exactly. You know, so I have other things that I do. I function actually in shipping today, mostly in shipping but still within the same oil industry because oh. the, the, the waste management I've been working on for the last five, six years, even more than that, actually has to do with the oil industry. It's not something that is generic or something that, is, um, that has to do with domestic waste. Okay. It's basically the treating and the proper disposal of waste that is generated in the process of drilling for oil. Oh, you know, so but, you know, we've, been in, we've been working on the technologies to deploy, the companies to work on for years, <laughs> and we're still on that journey. <laughs> and you still think there's an opportunity? Oh, absolutely. I mean, look, as long as there's oil, there'll be waste. Okay. You know, there'll be waste that is harmful to the environment. And in what, what we've discovered is that in developing countries like ours, there's, yeah. there's still a lot to be done. With when it comes to properly disposing this waste. Yeah. So it will be something that I'm passionate about uh, and, um, and continue to work on and pursue until, yeah. until it sees the light so of day. So when you say shipping, um, you, you ship stuff outside the country or you run a shipping line? Uh, no, I work for a shipping line. So we, we bring things into the country. Bring <laughs> <laughs> or you bring things into the country. Yes. Maybe I should just ask you this, because I know that um, the, the, the presidency set up um, a presidential committee um, to speed up the ease of doing business in Nigeria. One of yeah. the focus was how to um, facilitate, you know, the inflow and outflow of goods and services, mm -hmm. whether it's via the ports or the seas. Are you seeing any progress in that regard? Well, yeah, I mean, but it's very slow, You're, you know, and um, I think one of the reasons is simply because the deployment of technology is not pursued vigorously. Okay. 
um, deploying technology into systems makes them more, effi more efficient yeah. and more effective. And I think the more we deploy technology in our processes, the more they are not one person carrying files around and one person stamping something and one person emailing and scanning stump, you know, stuff from one desk to another. I think the moment we begin to leave those things behind to the point where things are done electronically, yeah. uh, I think the speed and the efficiency that we want in the system would naturally follow. Okay. So I, I think the more we deploy technology, and I, I know that a lot rides on the back of electricity, which is up till now a problem. So we can have beautiful plants, we can have beautiful ideas, but until the infrastructure to drive those beautiful plants are in place, it's going to be difficult. Yeah. If you have um, a system, I mean, now we have very good, so we have very good uh, support systems for electricity. We have server, sorry, we have um, inverters, heavy duty inverters. We have solar systems. I, I don't know how much of this the government is deploying, yeah. but until we deploy things that make electricity more constant and more regular, yeah. it's going to be difficult to deploy the technology that we need to run more as if, to run as efficiently and effectively yeah. as we want. So I think there's some improvements, but I, I think it, it's. Um, it's still a long way from where we need to be. Oh, great. So I hear yeah. you clearly. It's technology, it's infrastructure. Yeah. Therefore, progress can be made. Absolutely. Interestingly, so uh, when you, is it that when you come back home, you know, after a rigorous um, day at work and you shed your toga or being a, a businessman, you know, a shipping person, that you wear the musical jacket? <laughs> Tell me about that. Yes. It sounds yeah. fascinating that yeah. you, know, you have time for business and then you have time for music. To tell you the truth, I don't think these are, I don't think you wear these togas at different times. I think you wear them all together. Okay. The thing is just that one toga probably is on top of another <laughs> at a different time, Sorry. depending on what you need to do. Yeah. Because a lot of the ideas that I deploy, whether, I'm, whether it's musical or whether it's motorcycle driven, are things that have come to me at, you know, just in the regular course of the day. I don't have like programs or timetables yeah. for what I do at what time. I mean, being actively or physically involved with something like music, which involves maybe going to a studio yeah. or something, may have a timetable. But the, 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 the backstory of what happens in that studio and what happens after going to that studio is a continuous thing. The same thing with motorcycles. If you go, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm jumping the gun, yeah. but when you go on a ride, it's not when you're just about to go to that, on that ride, especially when it's a long ride, that you yeah. plan towards that ride or you, you, you know, you, you, you do something effectively with that ride. You, it's something you carry every day. So every single day, something about music, yeah. something that has to do with motorcycles, and something that has to do with work are happening simultaneously in my life. So let me imagine, do you give um, a couple of your CDs now to business clients that you know, stuff and say, you could listen to my track, um, you could ease your day at work. Do you have clients that listen to your... Oh, absolutely. Music? Absolutely. I mean, it's, yeah, absolutely. Does, does it help business go smoother? Um, not really, because, uh, yeah, maybe, well, except if the person is somebody who is into music, then, I mean, yeah. yesterday, it's, it's interesting that you're having this, you're asking me this question, because yeah. yesterday I visited a client, and she had listened to my song, right. and she actually went on Facebook, I was showing me clips of videos where I was singing with my daughter on stage, okay. and then she's a singer as well, so it was for one hour, we didn't talk business, we just talked music. <laughs> and I think it helps the relationship because yeah. you become closer to that person, you become friendlier. Yeah. So it makes it easier to discuss business. Oh great, any concert yeah. coming up anytime soon? Uh, there was one about three weeks, about a month ago. So okay. there, yeah, there's another one coming up in July. What's your, 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 your genre now? What genre do you uh, like to, you know, musically, what's your? Uh, I think I like different genres from, <laughs> depending on the feel. <laughs> from from root reggae to R and B to African uh, to have different African genres, you know. To Even rap music. Yeah, I like rap music. I mean, so long as it's not something aggressive, you know. There are some hip hop songs that you hear and they give you a headache. Yeah, sure. You know, because they're so aggressive and loud. You know, they're like club music where people are jumping and screaming. Now, if you play that kind of music for me. <laughs> it would give me a headache, you know, and I'm not, I, I like R&B that's soft, I like r uh, rap music that's soft, gentle, and has deep messages, you know, yeah. so yeah. I don't have a preference for genres. So 20 years from now, you still think you'll be doing music? 
Yeah, by the grace of God, I mean, absolutely. Until the day when I can't sing anymore, I can't move, I can't do anything. Uh, so so yeah. let's, let's say you're really, really passionate about, about your music. Oh, absolutely. Oh, that's great. Yeah. And, and let me come to where I find you the most fascinating human being. You know, I've seen, you know, I, I was on YouTube and I saw your ride from Lagos to Kainji and I thought that was um, crazy. Not until I was told that you'd actually done that trip from Lagos to Europe. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so which came first? Was it um, the trip to Europe or the trip to Kanji? Um, okay. It was all in steps. It was all in baby steps. And I think I need to emphasize when I yes. say a trip from Lagos to Europe. It wasn't a trip in a business class on an airplane. It was you riding on a motorbike with a group of young men driving across the country, across the continent. Yeah, I mean, we, we deployed everything. We rode, we rode on our bikes. We carried the bikes on aircraft. We carried the bikes on ferries across water. So we went, we did land, we did air, we did sea <laughs> on that same trip. So um, the thing is, before the ride to Europe, we had done several rides within the country. Yeah. Abekuta, Ilori, and Abuja, even all the way to Kano, yeah. a number of times, yeah. locally. Yeah. And then we had also done West Africa. We had done uh, Togo. Yeah. We had done Ivory Coast. And then we now said, all right, cool, so let's, let's do the ultimate. So in riding to Europe, I mean, we, we had done all these, local, West African, and then we did Europe. So after Europe, we have now, we've not done, we've not, we've not now done several other locals, okay. several other locals. Okay. But at the same time, I think June of last year, I also did a ride in the United States. We did about 6,000 miles in 10 days. <laughs> so, <laughs> now is, is there something behind the ride? Is it, is it just the feel of being in a powerful machine and you're driving across the country or you carry a message with you from, from Lagos to Kanu or from Lagos to Togo? Is there a message that you're sharing? Is there a particular awareness that you're creating? When you hit the, well, when the rubber meets the road? Absolutely. Um, a number of things drive me. And I think one above every other is the fact that I want to be an inspiration to people to dream. Okay. Every ride for me at the back of my mind is I'm hoping and I'm praying that the person who experiences me, whether physically on the road or by seeing our videos, dreams and actually pursues that dream. You see, that is the number one driving force for me. And secondly, we want to be a blessing. You see, every, every time we ride, you, you, uh, from where you start to the point where you end that trip and then you ride back, you're meeting people. Yeah. And whether it's just words of inspiration, words of encouragement, or giving physical things to those people, yeah. I, I want to be able to positively influence the life of people that I meet and the lives of people who, who come across those adventures, you know, whether it's like they see us ride or they hear us ride or yeah. they watch the films from those rides. Yeah. So, and then thirdly, but not um, the least, is the fact that I think if you look at the advertising in this country, yeah. most of what we do or, or the advertising budget, you know, goes to things that are music driven yeah. or Nollywood film driven or print or radio or TV adverts, basically. You understand? There are, there's, I, I've not really seen, apart from uh, uh, this something quest by Dajan Brew is, uh, uh, what's, it, what's it again? Uh, something quest, I think. Uh, Star quest by, uh, by Dajan Brew. I've not seen anything adventure driven. Okay. But you see, it's, it can be huge. We have, you know, having brands have promotions or marketing plans around things that are adventure driven, I think will wake up the adventure within the Nigerian again. You see, because before, when I was young, my father used to drive from Kano to Lagos with us in the 504 car. Yeah. I will never forget, those, those experiences are burned in my memory for the rest of my life. Oh, yeah. My uncle used to drive from Lagos to Kano in a Volkswagen Beetle. And they were, they were experiences I just loved and looked forward to. You know, every time, like stopping in Kaduna to buy bananas, <laughs> stopping in Mina to do oh, this. Yes. When you oh, get yes. to Jeba, you know, crossing the, the, river, the, the, Niger, the river Niger, and then just looking to your left and to your right, and then seeing all those canoes and the fishermen, and then getting towards, you know, Ayan Corny, and then Ilori, and then Ibadan, and then it was 
I used to dream as a child. Did you eat the Akara, the Ife Junction oh, yeah. regularly? Oh, yeah. <laughs> On every trip, every time we ride to Abuja, now, it's a ritual. Yeah. We, mu we must stop and eat that bread at Akara. <laughs> oh, for sure. You know, so I, I grew up dreaming about adventure. And then I, national, I started wa reading and watching National Geographic magazine since when I was eight years old. The beautiful pictures of wild animals, the scenarios, the safaris, I grew up watching those. Oh, great. I, and I so, need to know, because here I am sitting here, closing my eyes and trying to imagine the experience. Um, you taking the, the Nigerian flag, flying the Nigerian flag across various continents. Um, what did they think about Nigerians? What did they think about you? And how were you able to um, leave an impression with them that you think would... Um, leave a positive uh, uh, line, you know? I think it's a good thing because, you see, negative press sells yeah. much faster and easier yeah. than positive press. So all the terrible things that come out of this country are what you hear in the news. I mean, yeah. it's what, whether it's another country, it doesn't have to be Nigeria, you know, whether it's Ghana or it's America or whatever. It, it press is when it's the negative stuff, you know, because negative things grab people's attention because of our fear of danger. Oh, yeah. You understand? but. When we ride, and people see that, and that's why I like riding my bikes from here, because when we go to Europe, let me give you a typical example. We got to Germany, and one young, young, one young man looked at our plate numbers, and he saw Lagos with the flag of Nigeria on, on our plate. He said, you guys are coming from Nigeria? We said, yes. The guy was awed. We went to a party with about 300 motorcycles. Nobody came to take pictures with us. They were taking pictures of our plate numbers and our bikes. You know, so it was, it was good, positive, beautiful press for our country. I mean, I, I went into shops, motorcycle shops, where I was asked to put stickers. Uh, our name is Out of Nigeria, which we changed to Out of Niger because, you know, of um, copyright issues. But it was a beautiful pleasure when I go into places and they say, oh, put your sticker here. Oh, put your sticker here. We were leaving footprints that were positive for our country. That's beautiful. We did radio interviews, we did TV interviews, we did newspaper interviews, and we we're talking about the country. And I think it helped with the impression because it was easy. Everybody knew of Boko Haram, everybody knew of 419, yeah. everybody knew of, you know, whatever. But seeing Nigerians talk about positive things and saying, oh, you guys are responsible people in the country. And, you know, it's, it's an opportunity for them to say to the world, those guys that are representing us negatively are yeah. a tiny micro-fraction of, of the Nigerians. country. Yeah. Because we're out of time, and, yeah. and I really find what you do fascinating, because you're not just giving dreams to young people that anything is possible, you're also selling the Nigerian dream to the world, and you're also telling the world that Nigerians are ambitious and good um, and innovative um, uh, people. So um, going forward, uh, Mr. Toy, the biker, the musician, the businessman, um, what's the next big thing for you? There are so many big things, but I think uh, it's just to continue. The big thing for me is to stay consistent. So that's the biggest thing. Consistency is the To word. stay consistent. To stay consistent with helping young people find their dreams, young musicians, young adventurers, and to continue what we're doing with Out of Nigeria, to continue and to be consistent with sharing the message of hope, the sparing of patriotism, and the message of inspiration. Mr. Toy Adebola, it's been really interesting talking to you. I hope so. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.